And so um, we're recording this webinar. So in case you would like to watch it again or share it with any family members or friends or even your doctors, um, it'll be housed on our website and you can always share that link. And we'll send that link out to you in the next couple of days. So welcome to our virtual medical symposium series. We created this program because we want to give you, no matter where you are in the world, the opportunity to hear from the best information on genetic aortic conditions and different ways that they affect you um, from our professional advisory board and other leading medical experts. Um, and this truly is an international um, event. Even tonight, we have people registered from Australia, Belgium, Canada, um, Chile, Cyprus, Denmark, Spain, UK, South Africa, Norway, Poland, Israel, Japan, Mexico, and many, many more. So, you know, this is not our international E3 symposium, but we certainly are, you know, um, trying to help people all around the world um, throughout the year. So we're so excited to have you all here with us um, tonight. Um, in the past few years, we've covered many of the medical topics related to Marfan, Levy Seats, and Beds. And, and we have re received a lot of great feedback from all of you. This year, based on your input, you're gonna see that we're going to focus on more on answering your questions, your specific questions on these topics. So we always had the Q and A, but what we did this time, as you all know, is we asked you to pre-submit questions. And this way, our presenter was able to incorporate all your, the answers to your questions into um, her presentation tonight. And I love the way she did it. So um, that's our topic tonight is headaches and migraines, your questions answered. So before we go further, I'm going to introduce you to our president and CEO, Michael Weimer, to say a few words. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I like to come by and say hello and provide a little bit of information about the organization. Uh, if you're here internationally, I hope you're enjoying our political year. It's very exciting. Maybe not so, but uh, I'm glad you're, you're with us this evening. But, you know, there's a bunch of things that are happening which are, are really important. Uh, our E3 summit was amazing. I, I know a number of you participated in that. Over actually almost 3,000 attendees, seven different languages, 75 countries. Uh, we have Walk for Victory on the fundraising side, which is coming to a community near you. We'll have 26 uh, walks this year. Uh, we're very excited about that. For the first time, we have passed the uh, 81 cents of a dollar uh, going to mission organizationally. And 70, 75 cents is the gold standard. So uh, we're really honored that that much money is being spent on the mission of the organization out of every dollar that's raised. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be funding uh, over a million dollars this past year, 1.4 million uh, in research. You know, and so lots of great things that are happening. We have uh, the divisions. Some of you saw the logos. We have naturally Mar Marfan, which has been the, the mothership uh, we're really excited about our, our VEDS division, which just completed the first year. Uh, Lois Dietz became part of the foundation uh, July 1 and is off to a remarkable start. If you weren't here earlier, we had, uh, we had over 400 people with Lois Dietz uh, participate in the E3 International Summit. Uh, we continue to hope for a conference in Chicago in July of uh, 21. We'll know more on that after the first of the year. If you uh, are not from the States, uh, you know, we continue to struggle with COVID like uh, many other places around uh, the world. And the other thing I'll note is uh, come Friday, we will have our first international uh, board advisor. And so we really are expanding the footprint internationally, which we're very, very excited about doing. Doing that, if you're from Europe, uh, the CERN, uh, was an amazing partner uh, for E3. And we're looking forward and hopefully in a couple of years, we'll be back in Europe with our international uh, symposium as well. So a little bit of background about the, the organization. Please reach out to me at any point in time. I'm honored to uh, be able to work with you in this capacity. And with that said, Eileen, back to you. Great, thank you so much. So. Um... So tonight, you know, as you all know, we're talking about headaches and migraine, and I just wanted to give you a little background um, about um, about how you can participate in sharing your um, your experience with uh, headaches and migraines, and how you can help put that information to work for the research community. <sighs> so Backpack Health, as um, you have you may know if you've been around the foundation the last couple of years, Backpack Health is an app 
um, that you can download on your smart phone. It does two things. It helps you um, compile and take and track all your medical information so you can keep it all on the app. But the other thing um, Backpack Health is, it's the home of the International Marfan and Related Conditions um, International Patient Registry. And through that registry, once you, um, once you consent to be in it, your inf information is added in and you know, it's, it's de-identified and it's combined with everybody else's. And then there are little surveys that you can take to help us put together information on, um, on topics that uh, basically these topics are picked because you all told us that you're interested in them. So the first survey that we're doing this year, well, this year being you know, this, uh, you know, this starting this fall is on headaches and headaches and pain. And so just, I want to give you a little bit of information about what we've already found. So in, um, in this survey so far, you can see um, that um, of the people who have responded to this headache survey, uh, most of them, and it is a Marfan and related condition survey. So most of the people have Marfan syndrome, as you can see. It's also low seats represented, um, Ehlers-Danlos, VEDS is represented, and you can see the distribution there. Um, also, most of the people in there are female. And then in terms of the respondents' experience um, and how frequently they have headaches, 68% um, of them said that they do have them frequently. And then look how frequently they said they had them. You know, the most common answer was two to three times per week. So that that is a really big problem, not only, you know, in terms of pain, but also function and quality of life. And those are things that are very important besides just taking care of all your medical medical situations. Obviously, you need to be able to function on a daily basis comfortably. So um, we have these surveys are in Backpack Health. I wanted to give you a little taste of them and then just remind you that it's free to join this. You can access it through the Marfan website and here's a little information on that. Um, and if you go to marfan.org, you can look for it under health management tool. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about Backpack Health and encourage you to participate in that. Um, other surveys are coming up um, um, later this year. So tonight, finally getting to tonight's presentation, um, we have Dr. Adi Peretz from um, Stanford Medicine. She's a clinical assistant professor of neurology and neurological sciences. Her clinical interests focus on the diagnosis and treatment of headache and facial pain conditions. She is involved in medical education and received the Robert S. Fisher Teaching Award for Excellence in Neurology Resident Teaching of Stanford Medical Students. Her research interests include understanding the biological underpinnings of migraine and chronic daily headaches. She also participates in clinical trials of new headache treatments. So we're, get, we're about to start now. I just want to remind you all for any questions that you have, you can put them in the Q&A box. Don't go back to the chat box, put them in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Peretz is going to be answering so many of these questions that you guys submitted with your registration. Um, so be patient and maybe wait till she's done with the presentation to put your questions in there because she probably will be answering them. Anyway, so let me give her the remote control and stop talking myself. And um, so, I think I have to stop sharing as well. Stop sharing, there we go. Okay, and I will Perfect. shut my camera. Thank you, Eileen. I'm just gonna share my screen and then I will Sorry. Give me just one moment. You should be seeing the talk in just a moment. Just let me know. Okay. Everybody see? Here we go. I see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I just want to kind of thank the Mark Down Foundation and Eileen and uh, for this really great opportunity to get to speak to you about migraines uh, and headaches in general, but migraines in particular, as well as Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders as well. Uh, what a great organization, and I'm, I'm really uh, pleased and privileged to be able to kind of talk to you today. I want to go through a little bit of a roadmap of what I hope to discuss today, which is what is causing your headaches. I'd like to focus on migraines, and I'd like to talk specifically about migraine treatment considerations in the setting of connective tissue disorders. Thank you all for a lot of your questions. Uh, they were really great questions to help, kind of help guide me as I was figuring out what to speak about today. I'll do my best to answer them along the way, and I try to kind of highlight your questions in these text box, uh, boxes at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so you can see your question and that little question mark icon to kind of help you identify where I have uh, placed your questions and where I'm trying to give answers to them. Uh, while I will speak predominantly about Marfan syndrome, Lowy's deep syndrome, and vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as they relate to headaches, I will say that there is a paucity of data. And so Backpack Health and other kind of research platforms are great opportunities for us to learn more about 
the different conditions that you suffer from and how we can be helpful uh, in treating those. So first, let's talk about what's causing your headaches. Uh, one of the questions was, what are the different types of headaches? Well, there are many different types uh, from things as benign as tension type headaches, which are fairly mild headaches that many people suffer from, to more severe headaches, uh, headaches that are caused by tumors, for instance. So if the first and most important question that your clinician should be kind of trying to figure out is what's the underlying cause of your headaches? And there are some specific diagnostic considerations that we should take into account in patients with connective tissue disorders. And I'd like to go over some of those, but just because you have a connective tissue disorder doesn't mean that you will have these specific types of headaches. They are only diagnostic possi possibilities that warrant further evaluation. Um, so some of those diagnostic possibilities include intracranial hypotension or leakage of the cerebral spinal fluid, carotid artery dissection, cervicogenic headaches, Chiari malformation, and migraines. So all of these conditions can manifest in headaches along with a number of other symptoms. And I'd like to kind of speak to them in a little bit more detail here. One of the more interesting ones for me is intracranial hypotension, which is this leakage of the cerebrospinal fluid or the fluid that surrounds your brain and spinal cord. It sits inside, your brain and spinal cord sit inside the sac that's surrounded by the, uh, the sac is called dura. And within that sac, there's this fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And in cases of intracranial hypotension, that is due to a leak of that fluid out of a hole that is in the dura. So sometimes a hole is produced because uh, a woman gets an epidural and there's an accidental puncture of the dura uh, when they are going into labor uh, to kind of give them anesthesia. But there can also be spontaneous leaks of the cerebrospinal fluid. And the most common symptom for that is going to be headaches. And there is a classic description of those headaches, which is this orthostatic headache. So your headache gets worse when you stand up and it improves when you lie down. And that's classically how the headache is described, but it is not the only description of headaches um, that can happen with cerebrospinal fluid leak. There are also another, a number of other symptoms that could potentially happen with leaks, but don't always. And those can include things from chest pain, lightheadedness, double vision, blurred vision, facial pain, imbalance, hearing abnormalities, ringing in the ears, cognitive or mental changes, uh, as well as fluid collections in the brain, such as subdural fluid collection. So it's important if you have a number of other of new unusual symptoms, along with a positional headache that gets worse when you stand up or when you've been upright for prolonged periods, to potentially think about this diagnostic possibility. And the head pain is thought to result from downward traction of some of the pain-sensitive structures in the brain and the upper part of the cervical spine or upper part of the neck. So how does this relate to connective tissue disorders? Uh, connective tissue disorders can be predisposed to laxity uh, of the dura, of that sac that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And that in and of itself can predispose to a tear, but you can also have other, other risk factors for CSF leaks in the setting of Marfan syndrome, such as scoliosis, or having undergone surgery for scol scoliosis with uh, kind of the, the tools that are used to, to do that that predispose to a leak. Um, disc calcifications or discs uh, pushing on the dura can also do that. One of the very interesting questions that I got is, does dural ectasia cause headaches? So dural ectasia is a ballooning or outpouching of the dura that surrounds the brain and spinal cord, much like you have outpouchings of the of blood vessels in the setting of Marfan syndrome, Lowy's Dietz, and Lowy's Dietz, uh, you can have dural ectasia um, uh, in that sac that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And in one study, it was shown that about 60 to 90% of patients with Marfan syndrome have dural ectasia. Does dural ectasia cause headaches? That's a more difficult question to answer. It can certainly predispose to a leak if you have a ballooned area that is weaker it might be more susceptible to leaking uh, or to having a tear and leaking fluid. But having the dural ectasia in and of itself does, might not produce a headache. There really wasn't much in the literature to help me discern whether or not dural ectasia does cause headaches. There was one article that I found that looked at a number of patients with Marfan syndrome who had dural ectasia, and they showed that about 40% of those patients reported back pain, 30% had headaches, 20% had leg pain, and there were a number of other symptoms that were reported with decreasing frequency. 
The point with that though, was that there was no control there. There was no group of patients with Marfan syndrome who didn't have dural ectasia. So I think it is hard to make big conclusions from that particular study. In order to diagnose intracranial hypotension, you can start with an MRI of the brain with dye or with contrast, which can show signs of a leak. But in many patients, that might not be sufficient to actually show the signs of a leak. And it, you may require imaging of the spine to actually identify where the leak is coming from. Um, and that you know, involves seeing a really good anesthesiologist um, uh, or a good neurologist to try to discern whether or not your symptoms could be due to a leak and where that leak is coming from. What is the incidence of spinal fluid leaks causing headaches in the low disease population? Unfortunately, I think we don't know that information yet. I think we have a lot more learning to do to understand the various causes of uh, what the prevalence of CSF leaks is in the connective tissue disorder population, which may be higher than in the general population because of things like dural ectasia. So the treatments for CSF leak will include things like conservative measures, such as lying down, using an abdominal binder or staying hydrated. Uh, but also a lot of patients will end up needing something called an epidural blood patch, which is where your own blood is injected, ideally into the space where you're leaking, if that can be identified. And in a, in a small case series, about half of the patients who did not have successful uh, patching, uh, did not have success with blood patches, benefited from fibrin sealant, which is a different, it's also called fibrin glue. Um, and it is a different way to seal that leak space. Other patients will need to go on to have a surgery to seal that, but we have to be extra careful in patients with connective tissue disorders because of that dural laxity. After the procedure, oftentimes patients are advised to rest in bed for hours to days to make sure that that patch stays. And that kind of gives us a sense of preventive measures as well in that if you were having excessive straining or uh, excessive forces onto your body from whiplash injuries, bending over, twisting, roller coaster rides, et cetera, anything that could affect your aorta um, and, and predispose you to dissections of the aorta might also not be great for the dura. But this is, so there was a question about, does increased motion cause headaches from dural ectasia, such as bumpy car rides or even intercourse, it's not clear that it would necessarily, but it is possible. Um, and so taking extra caution, especially if you have previously experienced a CSF leak, um, it'll be important to prevent further leaks. Carotid artery dissections are where you have a tear in the layers of the blood vessel wall, and then blood collects between those layers uh, in the carotid artery in particular. And and a big risk factor for this is going to be vascular EDS in particular, uh, along with other connective tissue disorders, uh, such as Marfan syndrome. And the symptoms of carotid artery dissections, uh, most patients will present with a headache on one side of the head. So about 60 to 90% of patients have a unilateral headache. And they, in about a quarter of patients, they'll also have neck pain as well as potentially pain in the face. What you see here in this picture is a symptom that develops in 50% of patients, which is Horner's syndrome. So you can see on, in the left eye that this patient has a smaller pupil and a slightly droopy eyelid. And that's part of a Horner syndrome that can develop uh, related to or due to a carotid artery dissection. Um, patients can also go on to have uh, transient ischemic attacks or TIAs or strokes. Uh, if these things are not, if it is not recognized and treated appropriately, which is often with antiplatelet agents. Uh, one of the uh, questions that I got was, can the arterial tortuosity that is seen in Lois Dietz be the source of headaches? And I'm not quite sure the answer to that question. There are pain-sensitive structures in the brain, including some of the larger vessels and the dura, which is that sac that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And so if you had a, an aneurysm that was growing quickly or had a rapid change that might, or, or burst or ruptured, then that would be more likely to produce a headache. But the arterial tortuosity in and of itself might not, unless it was compressing a nerve nearby, or if there was, again, a rapid change in that. And hopefully that kind of answers your question about uh, headaches related to aneurysms as well.
um, that it really has to be next to the right structures or be large enough to be causing issues. Cervicogenic headaches are basically a headache that results from any disorder of the cervical spine, which would cause a headache and oftentimes neck pain with it. Um, and some of the risk factors for that might be cervical hypermobility, so hypermobility of the, uh, of the neck, especially uh, at specific joints, the atlantoaxial joint, which is the joints between C1 and C2, scoliosis. Uh, could also potentially predispose to this. And the treatment would be physical therapy, but you'd need to assess for atlantoaxial instability first to make sure that you're not going to injure anything. Some of the treatments can also include epidural steroids or cassette blocks, uh, which can be done through a pain clinic. And Chiari malformation is uh, a condition in which some parts of the brain sag down below what's called the foramen magnum. So you can see some tissue here that shouldn't be below the foramen magnum. And this is Chiari malformation. And the headache description that can result from Chiari malformation is often described as this pain at the back of the head, the occipital area or suboccipital area. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but somewhere around here, which is classically exacerbated by what we call Valsalva maneuver. So any bearing down or straining motion. Chiari malformation does occur um, in a decent percentage of the population. About 1% of normal adults who undergo an MRI actually have either cerebellar, which is the brain tissue down here, ectopia, or a, a, a five millimeters or more. And they will radiographically or on imaging be diagnosed with Chiari malformation. But only 0.01 to 0.04% of patients who have those findings have symptoms of Chiari malformation. So this is, an, this is sometimes an incidental finding. Um, and some of the risk factors might include connective tissue disorders, including earlier stanlos uh, because of the joint laxity. The treatment would be suboccipital decompression. I wanna kind of shift focus to talk about migraines. What I've been talking about before is something that I would call secondary headaches, but now I wanna talk specifically about migraines. And migraines are a chronic disabling disorder that's characterized by a toxic headache pain or head pain. And it occurs in a brain that is altered, a brain that is hyper excitable in genetically susceptible individuals. One of the questions that I got was, could migraines and Marfan patients be the result of head injuries? So head injuries can worsen migraines, and patients who have a pre-existing history of migraines, oftentimes a head injury will make, uh, will produce more headaches. Uh, headaches can also produce migraine, uh, sorry, head injury can also produce migraine-like headaches, but I don't think that uh, head, migraines in Marfan's patients are specifically a result of head injury. So to give you a sense for who this affects and how common it is, about 1 billion people in the world suffer from migraines, over 300 million people in the United States alone. The prevalence is quite high, it's about 12 to 15 percent, and it's more common in women. So 19 percent of women and 10 percent of men will experience migraines. Um, and it's the second most disabling condition worldwide. So to Eileen's point, we want to talk about how we can improve our quality of life in addition to focusing on all of the very important vascular things that are happening. Um, migraines can begin at younger ages and teenagers, but they tend to be more common, especially for women in their childbearing years between their 20s and 40s. Uh, they are, again, more common in women than men. As you can see in this graph, it kind of shows uh, age and the prevalence uh, of migraine cases. I wanna talk a little bit about what migraine is and how it's diagnosed. So there, migraine has different phases to it, beginning with oftentimes a premonitory phase or prodrome as it's mentioned here in the picture or in the slide, uh, where patients can experience symptoms hours to days before the onset of their head pain. And these symptoms can include irritability, depression, increased yawning or increased urination, food craving, sensitivity to light and sound, Symptoms that sometimes are subtle and sometimes are quite prominent and disabling even before the head pain begins. Some patients will go on to have a, uh, a symptom called aura, which I'll go through in a little bit, uh, while others will not have aura but will experience the headache 
and the characteristic headache of migraine helmet is diagnosed is based on meeting clinical criteria, which is delineated here. Migraine headaches are headaches that last four to 72 hours. They are characterized by unilateral pain, so pain on one side of the head that's oftentimes pulsatile, almost like a throbbing, um, that can be moderate to severe. So something that is kind of getting in the way of you functioning and doing what you need to do and aggravated by routine physical activities such as walking or climbing. And uh, these headaches are associated with either nausea or light and sound sensitivity, photophobia or phonophobia. We don't have any specific biomarkers that we use in the clinic to diagnose migraine. So it is really based on your clinical criteria, uh, meeting these clinical criteria and the absence of another underlying disorder that could explain your headaches. This head head pain phase is followed oftentimes by a postrome, which can last 24 to 48 hours and is characterized by an inability to concentrate, fatigue, depression, or depressed mood, a lack of comprehension. So taken together, this is days of symptoms that are disabling for patients. I wanna talk specifically about migraine with aura. About a third of patients will experience aura with their migraines. And these are attacks of recurrent reversible neurologic symptoms that develop gradually. And they're usually followed by a headache. They usually develop over the course of five minutes and will persist for five to 60 minutes. Pictured here is one of my patient's auras uh, that they painted for me. And usually the aura in 90% of patients, if they have an aura, is going to be visual. So they'll see a change in something, different lights or colors that will evolve and grow, or maybe they'll have a bit of a blurred or blind spot that will grow or change in the, over the course of time. Some of your questions really focused around uh, having visual disturbances without head pain, which is a phenomenon that does exist. And about one to three percent of patients, they will experience a headache, or not a headache, I apologize, they will experience an aura without the headache part. And, uh, and those are in patients who have a history of migraine. This tends to occur later in life. And then in terms of the relationship with uh, connective tissue disorders, I'm gonna get into that in just a few slides. But I wanna speak for a moment about migraine and stroke because aura is a, is a neurologic phenomena as is stroke and sometimes they can be confused. In fact, migraine with aura is the third most common mimic of stroke. So it's really important to know the difference between the two. And sometimes you can't tell. And it's and it, if you are developing new neurologic symptoms that you've never had before, it's really critical to get emergent evaluation in an emergency room. I put here for you on this slide, the signs of a stroke to be aware of. And, and the acronym BFAST is often used to help remind people of the signs of a stroke. So to go through those briefly, the B stands for balance. So any sudden loss of balance, the I stands for sudden visual loss in one or both eyes. The S stands for an uneven looking face. The arm stands for does one uh, a drift of one arm or a weakness in the arm, difficulties raising one or both arms. S stands for speech alterations. And the T is to remind us of the time and how important it is to get evaluated immediately uh, to treat a stroke. Uh, Migraine with aura is associated with an increased risk of vascular events uh, and of stroke and other cardiovascular events, but the good news is that the absolute risk is actually quite, still quite low, even though there is a slight increased risk. Uh, in terms of differentiating aura from a stroke, aura is generally what I would call a positive phenomenon, mean that, meaning that you have the addition of lights or colors or something into your vision or things feel tingly rather than things not moving or a loss of sensation, a loss of vision or a loss of movement. But I wouldn't say that that should be your driving uh, the decision maker for whether or not to go to the emergency room. If you have new and unusual events for yourself, you need to get evaluated. I think this is the slide that probably has the most questions. And for me, I have a lot of these same questions because unfortunately there's not a lot of information about this. There is some though. Um, and, and Eileen, what a great slide at the beginning to show that headaches are something that a lot of patients with Marfan syndrome commonly suffer from. I wonder what percentage of those are migraine. There were about three studies that I was able to find in the literature that looked at the prevalence of migraine uh, in patients with Marfan syndrome and showed that it is increased uh, more so than in the general population. And one of these studies 
showed in particular that migraine with aura is 2.2 times more likely in patients with Marfan syndrome who have undergone aortic root surgery. And among those patients, or those patients uh, who were more likely to have uh, migraine with aura had a history of migraine before they had aortic root surgery. So it's not the actual surgery that's producing the migraine with aura, but potentially the degree of disease. So in Marfan's patients uh, in that study who had not undergone aortic root replacement, but who had some dilatation, not yet requiring an operation, there wasn't an increased prevalence of migraine with aura. They also, in this particular study, didn't, have a clear, didn't show a clear association between migraine with aura and dorolectasia. Um, to kind of go back to one of your earlier questions about dorolectasia. Unfortunately, I don't have much information about the Louis Dietz population in terms of migraine prevalence, but I do suspect uh, that there is an increased prevalence in the Louis Dietz population as well. Why this is the case is a really interesting question. And it gets back to, well, what is the cause of migraines? And, and are there some shared mechanisms, uh, shared uh, pathophysiologic mechanisms here? So we're still understanding uh, the pathophysiology of migraine, but we do think that some of it involves a dysfunction of the inner lining of the blood vessels called the endothelium. Um, and there, we know that there's dysfunction of the blood vessels in Marfan syndrome, Lillian Dietz, and vascular EDS. So it's a, there's a potential that there's some common shared mechanisms that may produce both Marfan syndrome as well as, uh, as, well as migraine. Uh, but this is speculative, and I think we really have a lot more to learn here to understand uh, why migraines happen in patients with Marfan syndrome more readily. I wanna help prepare you for your appointments with your physicians when, you, when you're kind of going to talk about your headaches. So, you know, what types of specialist diagnosed migraines? Um, I think the best specialists are people like myself, of course, um, headache specialists, but there are certainly great neurologists that are wonderful at diagnosing and managing migraines. It's kind of under the neurologic umbrella. But the first person to talk to is gonna be your primary care physician or your cardiologist, and they can figure out who they need to ask for help about this. But to get you ready for this appointment, it's important to know your headache. Where does the pain happen? What does it feel like? How long does it last if you don't intervene on the pain? Or in other words, what is the natural course of your headache uh, in terms of duration? And how often, how many days a month is your headache happening? And to help you to track that, there are many different apps, calendars, uh, apps or, di or a diary that you can use to track your headache activity any potential triggers that you're being exposed to, and your response to treatment. It's of course important to know your medical history and to come prepared to your appointment with questions. Do you need to regularly follow up with a neurologist the way you do a cardiologist? That is a difficult question to answer, but I would say probably. Um, migraines are a condition that you're born with and you live with for life. We don't have a cure yet but it is something that can be managed. And at times you might find that it's managed so well that you don't need to follow with your neurologist regularly. But there are so many advances in the migraine world that you may wanna know what's new and out there. Um, and so I think semi-regular follow-up is not a bad idea, but I would defer to your, your local neurologist to determine what, what is needed there. I wanna talk about treatments, but I wanna talk specifically about what special considerations we would have for patients with connective tissue disorders. We'll speak to non-pharmacologic or kind of more natural remedies as well as pharmacologic options. I wanna focus on the overall picture here, which is the elements of a successful treatment strategy. It involves three different parts. One is lifestyle modifications. The second is rescue strategies, what you take in the moment when you're having a bad headache. And the third is preventive strategies. What can you be doing and taking to make you less likely and less susceptible to having these headaches? One of the questions I got was, is there a way to get migraines to stop and never come back? I wish. We don't have a cure yet, but we do have a lot of successful tools to make you less susceptible and less likely to have these headaches. But it does take all of these three approaches to really be the most successful. Let's talk about lifestyle modifications first. This, this is a recommendation no matter how frequent your headaches are, and I think will generally help you to live a healthier lifestyle. With migraines, fluctuations to your personal daily schedule can trigger them. They are more susceptible when you have an erratic and irregular schedule. And so the goal would be to maintain a very regular schedule with waking up at the same time every day, 
eating meals at regular intervals every day and getting regular exercise every day. I wanna say specifically, you know, there's questions, I often get questions about what's the diet that's gonna cure my headaches or uh, in this question, is there a correlation between digestive patterns and constant headaches? Would eliminating gluten help? There's really not great high quality data um, in terms of randomized controlled trials looking at different diet patterns or diet related triggers. However, uh, a number of studies that have looked at ketogenic diet, elimination diet, low fat diet, um, most of these showed a trend toward decreasing the frequency of migraine attacks. My personal philosophy is that if it's a diet that you can maintain and be healthy with, that I think it can be helpful as long as you are getting the appropriate nutrients that you need. With exercise, I usually recommend moderately intense aerobic activity for about 20 minutes a day. Um, with, with connective tissue disorders, I want to be very careful about saying that exercise should be at a moderate level to the point that you're able to still carry on a conversation. In terms of triggers of migraines, there are many commonly known or commonly appreciated triggers. Behavioral factors such as stress um, tend to be some of the more common triggers. Irregular sleep or non-working days, and the philosophy behind that is that not on non-working days, you have a shift to your schedule or routine, which can prompt more headaches. Environmental factors such as weather, or barometric pressure, or heat can oftentimes trigger headaches. And for some of my patients, they'll even say that they feel like a barometer that they can tell when it's going to rain because their headaches are starting up. Um, different odors can do that as well. There are some dietary triggers, alcohol and nitrates, maybe chocolate, although nobody wants to give up chocolate. Um, and physiologic factors that happen, um, for instance, with women in your menstrual cycle, that as you have an estrogen drop, you can be more likely to have a migraine. Um, so to answer some of these questions, why do weather patterns change? Uh, uh, why do weather patterns change has always caused headaches uh, and migraines in Marfan's patients? I think it causes headaches and migraines, or migraines in patients in the general population as well. And that probably is a susceptibility to a fluctuation in your routine which is out of your control. Uh, why are migraines more frequent certain months of the year? That may also speak to some environmental factors, uh, whether it's barometric pressure or heat or stress that may make you more likely in certain times of the year. Hormones and diet can certainly trigger migraines. Um, and migraines uh, occurring at different times of the day, um, that wouldn't necessarily affect treatment, except that we want to be mindful of the side effects that happen with different treatments. Some treatments, for instance, will make you drowsy, so you wouldn't want to take that in the morning when you're about to go to work. The non-pharmacologic strategies also include behavioral strategies, things like relaxation, uh, which is a way to kind of overload your brain circuits with uh, information so that it blocks this painful transmission, uh, the, the transmission of painful signals, or biofeedback or cognitive behavioral therapy which works on how your thoughts influence how you feel and behave. And it works on undoing dysfunctional thoughts like these headaches will never end and replacing those with more healthy thoughts that will help you um, and, and also challenging, challenging those thoughts logically. The idea with all of these behavioral strategies is to really put yourself in more active control of your headaches uh, and make you feel that you can impact the frequency or the severity of the attacks. Uh, physical therapy and acupuncture also have some great evidence in preventing migraine, especially acupuncture. Um, I would say chiropractic manipulation would be one to avoid because we want to make sure that we're not having rapid traction, especially to the neck um, and predisposing you to developing carotid dissection. But acupuncture has some great evidence in preventing migraine. Let's talk about rescue strategies. So we'll go through kind of the goal with... Uh, oh, Sorry, there we go. Um, the, the idea with rescue strategy is that you wanna treat early in the headache attack. You wanna use the correct dose and formulation. And unfortunately, our medications are not 100% effective 100% of the time, which means that you need to try these medications on at least two separate headaches to really judge if it's working. The other key with rescue strategy is gonna to be to limit the use of rescue medications to no more than two to three days per week. And the reason for that is that patients with migraine 
are more susceptible to developing something called medication overuse headaches, which means that you develop headaches as a result of taking rescue medications too frequently. So I generally recommend to my patients that it's best to avoid taking rescue medications more than 10 days a month, which means if you're having headaches more than 10 days a month, we need to focus on preventive strategies. So here I wanted to go through some of the rescue strategies that you can use to help uh, with your headaches. And I tried to kind of delineate them as in green medications that are likely considered safe in the setting of connective tissue disorders. In red, those are medications that I would avoid both for connective tissue disorders and for other reasons. And the yellow are medications that deserve a little more conversation with your neurologist or cardiologist to make sure that the quantity or the medication itself is a safe thing for you to take. In terms of safe medications, uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen is, a cer is certainly a reasonable option. In antiemetics, specifically the dopamine antagonists, are one of my favorite medications to use because they can actually help not only with nausea, but they can help with migraines as well. One of the most common side effects to be aware of is feeling drowsy. Um, and so you have to kind of be prepared to be drowsy and be, be prepared to sleep after you take it, which is why it's not my favorite first line, but it is my favorite backup. Um, there are some patients can go on to develop what we call extrapyramidal side effects. They'll feel restless and agitated, um, and that can be very uncomfortable, and you probably will not want to repeat the medication if you have those side effects. It can also prolong the QT interval on your EKG, so important to mention to your cardiologist or make sure that your cardiologist is okay with it. In terms of medications to avoid, triptans are the mainstay of migraine management. They were developed for migraines. They are a reasonable option for people with migraines, but they are not safe to take in the setting of connective tissue disorders because they narrow the blood vessels or cause vasoconstriction. And so we, we don't wanna be taking medications that would, be cut, that would be at all affecting your blood vessels in an adverse way. Ergotamine has the same concern. And so ergotamine, uh, dihydroergotamine, um, or other ergotamine products or triptans should be avoided. Butalbital containing products such as Bioracet and opiates, I put in the medications to avoid categories because these are not, not good medications for long-term management of migraines. In fact, they can cause rebound headaches more readily. They have an addiction potential. They're quite problematic medications um, and I recommend avoiding them if possible. In terms of medications to think about a little bit more, with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they do inhibit platelet function, they increase bruising, and while they don't demonstrably increase arterial damage or damage to your arteries, theoretically they could. Um, and so I think it's important to check with your cardiologist about the amount that you can safely be taking and the frequency with which you can safely take them. Naproxen is probably safer from a cardiovascular perspective than some of the other non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It does take longer to kick in, but it lasts longer than some of the other non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, so it's an interesting option to think about. With muscle relaxants, if you have cervical instability, uh, you may wanna just be a little bit more careful. Things like baclofen, tizanidine, cyclobenzaprine um, could, uh, trigger more headaches if they, if they make you, if they relax muscles a little bit too readily. Um, are there migraine medications that are safe or contraindicated? I think I kind of answered a bit of that question uh, in, the, in the connective tissue disorders. Is it safe for someone with Marfan? Someone with Marfan's or low for take Imitrex? Again, I don't think it's a safe medication to take, but that would be a conversation with your cardiologist or neurologist. It's possible that they may allow you to take a very small amount, but I wouldn't advise it. In terms of rescue medications besides uh, uh, anal, uh, analgesics that are safe for semi-regular use, the idea of semi-regular use is a little bit tricky with rescue medications because we wanna be careful about how often you're taking it, but some of these are reasonable options to think about. Is CBD oil effective and recommended to treat headaches? Uh, that's a really interesting question. And unfortunately, CBD or cannabis has not been established as a standard treatment for headache disorders. Some literature does suggest that there is a medicinal use for cannabis in multiple uh, conditions, including as a therapy in migraines, but there's a heterogeneity uh, genetic to the product. Um, and we don't have large randomized controlled trials yet, so I wouldn't recommend it as a standard of uh, medication to use. 
I want to take a moment to speak specifically about some of the newer medications that have been developed in the migraine world for treatment of migraines. And, and there is a class of medication called positonin gene-related peptide or CGRP antagonists that have been developed and they're, they play a pivotal role in the pathophysiology of migraines. There are multiple newly FDA approved medications that either block CGRP or block its receptor to provide either acute pain relief or, or to prevent migraines. CGRP has receptors throughout the body, so not just in the nervous system, but also in the cardiovascular system and the gastrointestinal system. And it is a potent vasodilator, so it keeps the vessels open. It also plays roles in regulating vascular resistance and regional blood flow. And the reason I mention this is because these medications are being used to both prevent migraine and to treat it acutely in the moment. And I've listed here for you the class of medication, the drugs in those classes, as well as the FDA indication. So all of these medications are either indicated for prevention or for, again, migraine rescue. Because CGRP is a potent vasodilator, one of the questions uh, that we all have is whether or not it's safe for people with cardiovascular disease to take it. Um, so far, animal studies haven't, uh, or studies in healthy humans without a history of connective tissue disorders haven't demonstrated adverse effects from a cardiovascular perspective. So it is very possible that these medications are safe. But I wanna caution you to, to speak with your neurologist and cardiologist about this because these medications have not been studied in, in a connective tissue disorder population. And when it has been studied in patients with cardiovascular disease, those patients didn't have a history of migraines, um, but there weren't uh, adverse cardiac events in those, uh, in those studies. So I think this, this is an area that deserves a lot more attention um, and some caution. And I think time will tell as we see more patients try this. So one of your questions is Engality, which is galconezumab, this medication, the third medication here, I'm sorry. Uh, is it safe for use in LDS? In theory, um, yes, because there haven't been adverse events demonstrated, but I think you need to talk with your cardiologist and neurologist more to make sure that you are okay taking that potential risk. In terms of other rescue medications, um, losmitatan, which is another newly FDA-approved medication uh, that targets a serotonin receptor, is a really interesting option and I think probably safe because it does not narrow the blood vessels. There are a number of side effects to be aware of. Um, that being said, I, I think it is one to consider. And then in here, I put in the yellow, uh, those newly FDA-approved rescue medications for migraine that block CGRP. And I just went over that in the last slide. Peripheral nerve blocks and sphenopalatine ganglion blocks are really interesting options uh, in that they can provide some immediate relief and they're generally safe and well-tolerated procedures in patients with connective tissue disorders or in the general population. What they involve is an injection in the case of peripheral nerve blocks of anesthetic or numbing medication into specific areas. Um, it, sometimes can involve using corticosteroids. I generally avoid corticosteroids because of potential for other longer term side effects. Um, and then the sphenopalatine ganglia block, I often liken to a deep nasal spray. There's some limited literature on its efficacy. Um, however, it's again, a relatively well tolerated procedure. And I don't know of any contraindications to using that in patients with Marfan syndrome or other connective tissue disorders. The reason that these get a little bit less attention is that the, there is a lot of heterogeneity in how different uh, neurologists or uh, pain specialists do these procedures, uh, in particular the peripheral nerve blocks. And so we don't have great uh, studies that help support their use, but I think they do have a role both acutely in managing pain and also potentially as a preventive, um, but there's really limited data on that. The reason, again, that I like these, these options so much is more so because they have limited side effects. Um, and again, they're well tolerated. So I don't have to worry about giving patients a lot of different side effects. I want to shift focus to talk about preventive strategies to kind of give you an overview of what our goals are and, and how to pick preventive strategies. The goal with prevention is to reduce the frequency, severity, and duration of your pain to improve your response to acute treatment. And overall for me, when my patients are functioning better and they're not as disabled by their pain, that is a huge win. 
We wanna reduce reliance on rescue medications because there are limits with how often you can take it. Enhance your sense of personal control. Imp improve your health-related quality of life and reduce headache-related distress and psychological symptoms. So some guidelines. How do you know if you need to be on a preventive medication? If you have attacks that are interfering with your daily routines despite using acute medication, if you're having frequent attacks even more than four month, uh, headache days per month, if you have contraindications to have failed or overuse acute medications, or if you've had adverse events, or if you prefer, these are all good reasons to be on preventive medication. So here again, I use that same kind of uh, way to, to delineate medications that I feel are safe or need further conversation. Um, among the preventive medications, if you wanna go as natural as possible, some of the vitamins and minerals uh, work very well in preventing migraine. They have to be taken on a daily basis for two to three months to really notice an improvement. Uh, but those can include things like riboflavin, magnesium, or coenzyme Q10. There are also a number of other oral medications that have not been specifically designed for migraines, but that are used to prevent migraines and have some evidence uh, in that regard. All of these oral medications have to be started at a very low dose and gradually increased. Um, and they all have their different host of side effects. So it's important to talk with your neurologist about which one may be the best fit for you. Um, they have to be tried for about eight to 12 weeks to really, again, see a difference at their gold dose. And some of those can include the anti-seizure medications such as valproate and topamax, which should not be used in patients who are planning to try to conceive because they're not safe for fetal development. Uh, it also includes antidepressants, such as the tricyclic antidepressants or venlafaxine, um, as well as antihypertensives, uh, which I would exercise a little bit of caution in just because we want to make sure that your blood pressure is in the right range and that your uh, neurologist and cardiologist are in agreement of what should that be. From an evidence perspective alone, some of the more effective medications are going to be the valproate and topamax or topiramate as well as some beta blockers such as metoprolol and propranolol, which some of you may have already been on. There is some evidence to suggest that the angiotensin receptor blocking agents could be helpful as well, um, such as candesartan in particular, although I know many of you might be on uh, losartan or herbisartan. Sorry, I highlighted some of the oral medications in this slide. Um, are antidepressants an, a good option for treating migraines? Yes, and they can help um, they can help in other ways as well for depression, although the dosing tends to be different. So if you do have depression, that needs to be managed sometimes separately. Um, what's the best treatment for chronic migraine? I think that depends on who you are and what your needs are um, and, and what side effect profiles might work best for you. Um, one of the medication options that I think is a quite a safe option and reasonable option for patients who have chronic migraine is onabotulinum toxin A or Botox. Um, and, and it is FDA approved for chronic migraine prevention. And chronic migraine is defined by having more than 15 headache days a month. So you're quite disabled um, by having headaches half the month, at least half the month with eight of these meeting criteria for migraine. That means that some of your other, other headaches may not be as severe, but you're still having chronic migraine because at least eight of them qualify as migraine. And we do Botox uh, according to a specific protocol where if there are 31 shots that are done every 12 weeks, according to, again, this preempt protocol is the name of the protocol, and I've, I've shown you the picture here. I think it's a very reasonable and safe option to do for patients with connective tissue disorders. The only area to be a little more cautious in is in these upper neck injections that you should just check to make sure you don't have any cervical instability um, because we don't want to over weaken the muscles in the neck. Botox is a temporary muscle paralytic, so you just want to be careful about not weakening the neck muscles too much. Uh, it can take a few rounds for this medication to reach its peak benefit. And so I typically recommend for my patients to stick with it for a few rounds. Again, minimal side effects with this treatment option. So it can be a very good one. Feel free to interrupt me. I know I'm kind of cutting it close. Um, uh, just a few more things. So here I'm just highlighting again, um, the CGRP monoclonal antibody uh, receptor or molecule antagonists, those ones that I talked about that were FDA approved, that again, I think deserve a little bit more conversation with your neurologist and cardiologist to see if it's something that 
you feel is a reasonable risk to take. I want to also highlight some of the devices that have been recently FDA cleared for migraine prevention or rescue. These don't tend to be covered by insurance, and so oftentimes you have to pay out of pocket, so you have to be aware of the cost of these devices, but some of them are very interesting and reasonable. None of them have been studied in Marfan, so near connective tissue disorder population. So again, they deserve conversations with your cardiologist or neurologist. Um, this one, the Nerivio device, uh, is an armband that you wear that provides electrical stimulation into your arm uh, using your smartphone um, and is approved for, or it is authorized for, F, for uh, migraine rescue. And the other two both do uh, rescue and prevention, although the data on these is not as robust as one might like compared to some of the other medications. I kind of want to wrap up here with saying that first, there are many causes of headaches so, and some unique diagnostic considerations for patients with connective tissue disorders. I hope I highlighted some of those for you today. If you have particular interest in CSF leaks, one of my colleagues, Dr. Ian Carroll, is actually a CSF leak expert and uh, would be happy to speak with your foundation, I'm sure. Um, migraines do occur with increased frequency among patients with connective tissue disorders, although I think we have a lot more to understand there. Treatments do need to involve an, a multidisciplinary approach, uh, focusing not just on medication, but also on lifestyle modifications, on the rescue medications, as well as preventive strategies. Um, and you should speak with your cardiologist and headache specialist about risk with specific migraine treatments and decide what, what makes the most sense for you. That is most of what I had to, I wanted to talk about today. Thank you so much for listening. And I, uh, Eileen, I don't know if you want to, yes, want yes. me to stop sharing. Yes, yes that was, and that was incredible. Um, I'm going to, um, pull up my slides again. Um, and um, so now we're so excited. That was, that was incredible. Um, so much information and you answered so many people's questions. Um, action packed hour for sure. Um, yes. We'll take a couple more, we'll take a couple more questions here. Um, let's see if we can find some, some questions that might not be um, quite so detailed. Um, I have one here that looks at the, about you, Brelvi. Um, that was one of the CGRP antagonists, the Remegipant um, and uh, Ubrojipant are, are both CGRP blocking agents. Uh, that was one of the ones that I talked about. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. What about hallucinations and migraines? Is that a thing? Is that related? So I, I think that one's a little bit tricky for me to answer. I'd have to have more information about what you mean by hallucinations because as we talked about, aura does happen in a third of patients with migraine. And so uh, it could be that if the hallucinations are visual, it might be that your son is seeing some visual phenomena that are happening associated with the migraines, and it could be, again, an aura, uh, not, not necessarily hallucinations. So we may not be using the term in the same way. Okay, great. Um, a lot of these questions I know you've, that we've answered already. Um, there's um, another question here about CBD, CBD, and I know you addressed it. We have another specialist we work with who is a specialist in that area. And um, his name is Jordan Tischler, and I will point you guys to that information as well. Um, he has, that's his main area of study. So we can definitely talk about that and get you some more information. So um, thank you guys. So thank you all so much for these questions and um, Adi for taking so much time to share all of that with, the, with us. I have a couple more things before we close out tonight. Um, and um, I do wanna let you know that some things we have coming up and then talk to you about any other questions that you might have on this topic. So um, for anybody who is new to the foundation or to remind you, we have a special program if your kids are going to be in the hospital, whether they have market and low seats, um, beds, um, the Sydney Lerman Pediatric Hospitality Program. And um, we, we say with, because of the generosity of the Lerman family and all of the people who support this program and those are the Lermans on the left, um, um, we send packets to packages to kids um, to provide support in hospitals. So um, if your kids are having um, any surgeries coming up, go to this website, marfan.org slash Lerman, and we are happy to involve you all in that and support your kids. Um, also coming up in the foundation this year, brand new year, brand new, a lot of brand new things from the foundation. We have virtual support groups um, still, and there are some new ones out there. Um, we have a team chat once a month and a team game night once a, once a month, and that's all um, virtually, of course. Our mentor program, we have a lot of mentors who are ready for mentees. So if you are looking for somebody who's gone through 
what you are going through and want somebody, somebody to talk to who knows what it's like, um, go to the mentor program on our website. And these are all available through marfan.org, loisdeets.org, and thebedsmovement.org. And because of huge demand, we have new Marfan swag, not just Marfan, but also Lois seats and beds, t-shirts, um, a lot of a lot of masks. So a lot of people were asked, have been asking us for masks. So we have masks with all different of the logos and sayings and all that. Again, it's all on these websites. So um, make sure you go look at those. And as Michael mentioned, Walk for Victory is coming back in the spring. Hopefully we are going to be, hopefully we'll be in person and we will see you all in 26 cities around the country. We have plans in place so they, we can be socially distanced and um, abide by all local regulations that might be in place. So we'll be starting those up in March. There are 26 cities. You can go to markband.org slash walk to see where we will be. We have a brand new incentive program. So if the other swag wasn't enough for you, we have all this great new swag, we, you know, depending on how much you raise. So there's everything from stickers and mugs up to long sleeve t-shirts and tote bags all the way up to uh, smart TVs and iPad mini. Um, these are really, and these are really cool. Um, those camper chairs, you bring them to the soccer game and everything. So lots of really fun stuff. Um, and of course, it's a great way to get involved with the foundation and to meet people who are just like you from your area. Finally, if you have more questions, I'm like, I, like I think I said before, but any questions that you asked tonight that were not answered here, we will give them to Jan, the nurse in our help center, and she will answer them. And anything that she has trouble with, she will contact a D and the D will be hearing from Jan um, to answer the rest of the questions. But if you have questions on this topic or any other topic um, related to Mark Van or beds or Louis Dietz, you can go to markvan.org slash ask. And Jan um, will be happy to help you. She is incredible. And then finally, um, our next webinar um, is related to the Gentech Aortic Summit that Michael talked about earlier tonight. This was a big scientific meeting and there's a lot of great new information that we wanted to share with all of you on things that are really um, of interest to people with these conditions. So Dr. Kim Eagle will be here with us on Thursday, November 19th. And he, along with our Chief Science Officer, Joe Grima, um, will be sharing highlights from the Gentech Aortic Summit. So you can hear the latest um, and what the researchers all talked about at their meeting earlier this month. Um, and we'll be sending out that the link to register um, within the next week, I'm sure. So anyway, so that's the next webinar. We have lots of great things planned for you guys in the coming year. And so watch for more of these webinars. Um, please tell us what else you're interested in hearing about. Um, and then before we say good night, I just wanna thank Adi again for her incredible presentation. Do you have any final words before we, before we disconnect here? No, thank you so much. I was just uh, typing some answers to some of your very thoughtful questions. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. It is um, my pleasure and privilege to get to treat patients with headaches. Uh, it is what I do and, and to be able to kind of speak to specific considerations in the Marfan syndrome and Louise Dietz and vascular EDS populations is really important to me. So thank you. And thanks for all that, that you're doing to create such a great organization. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we're so happy to have such a great resource like you and um, we're so easy and responsive. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from us and from Jan a lot um, with these questions. So thank you everybody and have a great night and we'll see you next time. Take care.